For more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hello, welcome to People's Dispatch and Globetrotter. Um, I was actually surprised this week to read um, a report from Amnesty International with the title that said, Israel's Apartheid Against Palestinians. Well, the word that surprised me was apartheid. This is a 280 page report, multi-year investigation uh, to get here. It's not that Amnesty is the first out of the gate here. One should say that. I mean, two years ago, uh, I read the report that came from Yesh Dean, which is an Israeli mm -hmm. organization. Yesh Dean said it's a difficult statement to make. But the conclusion of this opinion, and this is two years ago, is that the crime of hu against humanity of apartheid is being committed in the West Bank, specifically West Bank, but they use the word apartheid. So did Al Haq. So did Adamir, the Palestinian groups. So did Human Rights Watch. So did Beth Salem. So did the um, United Nations in an important paper by Richard Falk, Virginia Tilly in 2017. Nonetheless, Amnesty International has said apartheid, a word that is very sensitive because it has implications which we'll get to. So happy to be joined today by Philip Luther, 20 plus year veteran of Amnesty International. <laughs> well done, Philip. That's amazing. Uh, he's a Thank Middle you. East and North Africa Research and Advocacy Director at Amnesty. Philip, congratulations on the report. Tell us about the report, the implications of it, and so on. Thank you very much, Vijay. This is a report that has been four years in the making. Uh, it's involved extensive research. It's involved extensive digging into our own archives, as well as reviewing the work that others have done, whether it would be UN agencies or whether it be the work that you alluded to a moment ago, which is, uh, and you're right, we are not the first to say this. Palestinian human rights organizations have been using the apartheid framework for some time. And more recently, as, as you rightly say, Israeli human rights organizations, some Israeli human rights organizations have adopted uh, the framework either as you say, with respect only to the West Bank or in a couple of cases with respect to the entire uh, region of Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. And we felt it was important for us uh, to come to our own conclusions. So we've done the work independently. Uh, this is a, a very big issue and there's a big debate out there. And the reason we have taken longer uh, is partly because we ourselves wanted to ensure that we had a solid basis that we felt was impartial before embarking on the research. And Amnesty is a, it's a big organization, it's a complicated organization. So the big strategic decisions are taken by the representatives of our membership. So we first of all uh, worked on guidelines for how to apply the apartheid framework. That was in 2017. We have since applied the framework to Myanmar with respect to the Rohingya. Uh, and we've been working on the situation in Israel-Palestine. And our conclusion is that there is indeed both a system of apartheid, and I can explain that further, but also that crimes against humanity of apartheid, and you know, we've really gone into the definition here and, and, and made sure that we understand exactly how to present both because they're interlinked but separate, crimes against humanity of apartheid being committed in the whole of the region of Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories and, and this is another part of analysis, and with respect to Palestinian refugees in the diaspora, insofar as Israel controls, as in denies, their right to return to their, to their families' homes in, in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. So that's an interesting place to begin. Um, this is actually one of the first reports that's br that brought the three aspects of the Palestinian experience to bear. In other words, Palestinians inside what is called 1948 Israel, Palestinians in the occupied Palestinian territory, Gaza, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Palestinians in the diaspora. Um, this is a little bit, I think, unusual in terms of the comprehensiveness but I think this brings us to the question, what is this system of apartheid? Can mm. you explain that? That seems to be the core 
of the challenge here? Absolutely. I mean, that is the first question we try to answer in the report. It, and just to break it down, a system of apartheid is an institutionalized regime of oppression and domination by one racial group over another. Uh, and that manifests itself in the laws, policies, and practices of the state that is has created and maintained that system of apartheid. To be a bit more concrete and to, 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 to explain what I mean by that, I mean, we looked at what we call four, four strategies that Israel has used and, and, and is currently using. And, and this is the important thing, they being used and have been used across these territorial domains, even though the exact, the laws and the practices may differ in when you look at the detail, what we find is that there is territorial fragmentation, and that is a deliberate uh, strategy, territorial fragmentation of Palestinians between Israel, East Jerusalem, the West, rest of the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and the Palestinian refugee diaspora. And that fragmentation is key to understanding why, even though, and it's acknowledged because some detractors say, ah, you're not, you're ignoring the fact that Palestinians inside Israel, Palestinian citizens of Israel have the right to vote. It is true, of course it is. But the fragmentation means that Palestinians as a whole have not to date been meaningfully able to influence the laws, the policies and the practices that not only affect their lives, but actually ensure that they are either second class citizens or third or fourth. Uh, so that's the first thing. Then, then we look uh, very carefully at the question of segregation. And what we mean by segregation uh, is the fact that in each of those territories, and but across those territories, Palestinians have different statuses. So they may be citizens, they have, but they're second class citizens. And we describe why, because of an institutionalized uh, a regime of discrimination inside Israel. There is, in, in East Jerusalem, uh, Palestinians uh, have residency rights, but no citizenship, which mean, and it's supposed to be permanent, but actually it's permanent in name only. There are, in the last, uh, in, the, in, in the last, uh, in, in, in the last 40 years or so, uh, 14,000 Palestinian refugees have had their residency rights revoked by the Israeli authorities. So, and then of course, West, rest of the West Bank uh, and Gaza, it's ID cards, which means you're uh, completely restricted. And the important thing about that is it, it breaks up families. You may be, you, you have family members in Gaza and you live in the West Bank, you have no right to see them. I mean, you, we, you meet people uh, every day who are saying, well, I haven't seen my mother for four years. She's in Gaza. I'm in, I'm, I'm in the West Bank. I mean, it's, it's just that everyday experience, which it's, it, uh, it's, it's obviously, it dominates people's lives because it's all about their home. It's about their family. And it's about a dignified life. Uh, we talk about this, I mean, this is a big issue, dispossession of land and property. And, and you see the same strategies have been used uh, over decades to, to dispossess Palestinians of their land and property and allocate it in a discriminatory fashion to Jewish Israelis, either within Israel itself, or indeed, the, of course, the illegal settlements on occupied Palestinian land in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. And finally, and in a way it complements all of that, it, the fourth strategy is the deprivation of economic social rights. The fact that there is a chronic uh, uh, discriminatory underinvestment in Palestinian communities in, in Israel and the reality that Palestinians are deprived of access to their own resources, their own resources, the most fertile farmland, their own oil, the coastal fishing waters off, off Gaza because of a deliberate policy by the Israeli state. So that is why, to sum up, we talk uh, about a holistic system and while, while we acknowledge that there may be uh, of course very different lived experiences for Palestinians the system is one because there's one state there's one people who were impacted by the policies of that state the Palestinian people and it's and in the apartheid definition it's about a racial group um, 
there's one Supreme Court that is uh, uh, that at the end of the day is the highest court in the land, whether you're an Israeli or Palestinian, across all of those territories. Um, and it, it is the intent, which we also examine in the report, to ensure a Jewish demographic hegemony across that whole area, which is where the, the, the refugees come in, because the reason that Israel, and it's, it, it's open about this, I mean, this is, it's not even a secret, the reason that Israel does not want to give the, the Palestinian refugees the right to return is because it disrupts the Jewish hege demographic hegemony. So that is why we don't think you can ignore or le leave out the Palestinian refugee issue when examining the system that is in place. It's very important that you said that. I, I want to switch to the other point, um, but I want to come at it from March 2021. You know, mm -hmm. I've been covering the well, shall we call it the confusing aspect of the International Criminal Court where uh, mm. Special Prosecutor Fatih Ben Souda eventually mm. in March 2021 said that, well, she is going to open an investigation. She used very strong language, Philip. She said that um, mm. it's going to look into uh, crimes regarding the Rome statutes. Now, mm. we know that that includes genocide allegations, crimes against humanity. There's four different things that it brings up. When I was mm. reading your report, I saw that you said Amnesty said these acts amount to the crime against humanity of apartheid again under both the apartheid convention that's mm. you know, uh, and the Rome statute. Uh, I, I was struck by that because it seems to me mm. This brings evidence, 280 pages of evidence that should be logged into the, um, the International Criminal Court. Uh, what do you feel? Do you feel that this is going to advance the cause of the investigation in the ICC or what, what do you feel? Well, we certainly hope so. I mean, the International Criminal Court currently has jurisdiction over crimes committed within the occupied Palestinian territories. And that's an important point because at the moment, uh, it, it, it does not have jurisdiction over Israel, 48 Israel. And that is because the reason it has jurisdiction is because of the state of Palestine that invited it to have that jurisdiction. And it, it, it of course, Israel rejects that jurisdiction over its territory and it would require, therefore, a UN Security Council resolution to enable it to have jurisdiction over the whole of Israel. Nevertheless, nevertheless, it's a very important, uh, it's, an, it's a very important investigation. And we've moved over the last few years from the prosecutor conducting a preliminary examination, which means that the office of the prosecutor examines whether there is a, a prima facie case, whether there is at least enough evidence to move to what is called a formal investigation. And that is where we are now. There is a formal investigation into crimes uh, that fall within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. Uh, and that is crimes such as crimes against humanity, war crimes, the most serious crimes at the end of the day for the, uh, that uh, the, the international community has, 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 has laid down in documents, as you say, like the Rome Statute. And the, uh, we have, uh, of course, submitted material to the International Criminal Court before on work that we've done over the years, such as the uh, war crimes, or at least our allegations of war crimes by Israel, in some cases by Palestinian armed groups during conflicts. But there's an opportunity that the uh, Office of the Prosecutor has to, to look, examine whether the crime against uh, apartheid applies. Now, our material clearly is about puts the responsibility at the level of the state. We're, we're not a judicial institution. Obviously, when we talk about crimes, and just what we mean here is that these are acts, and they may be acts of torture, they may be acts of arbitrary detention, locking Palestinians up in prisons. In some cases, they are, we were talking to the father today of a uh, of, of a 17 year old who's in administrative detention held without charge or trial uh, by the Israelis. He's just had uh, his uh, administrative detention order extended by uh, another six months. He's ill, we're really worried about, about him. But these, 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 these things are, these, these acts are, are potentially uh, crimes um, or forcible transfer. What do I mean by that? I mean, when people are, are pushed out of their homes um, 
and you know take the the Negev region, the Bedouin community in the south of Israel. I mean, the seven thousand uh, homes and, and other buildings have been have been demolished uh, in the six year period between two, 2013 and 2018. I mean, this it's East Jerusalem. You can talk about Sheikh Jarrah. Um, you can talk about the Palestinian communities in the West Bank, who like Khen al Ahmar, who have uh, the threat of home demolition every day. These are these acts are potential crimes and behind a crime there is a criminal i mean and it is to identify who is responsible you need an investigation that's exactly what the the international criminal courts office of the prosecutor has done and they need to look at well okay if you take if you take the pattern of these crimes unlawful killings the killings of protesters in un, un, unarmed protesters in demonstrations in gaza in the west bank some to a lesser extent in israel who ordered that who carried it out but particularly who ordered at a high level look at the command the chain of command and that that is uh, that's not work that we do that's work that the office of the prosecutor needs to do and importantly then may be able then to move to something like prosecution these take a long time but it's it's absolutely important that that the impunity that currently reigns because Israel does not bring these people to account, that there's, there's some hope for justice. Well, hope for justice. Meanwhile, uh, let's um, look at what has happened. Your report came out, 280 pages. I, for my sins, spent an entire night reading it, printed the whole mm -hmm. thing out. My printer huffed and puffed as it came out in, in unfortunately color. Didn't want to stop it. It's a beautiful report. On the other hand, before they finished reading it, I feel Philip, I'm not sure. U.S. Ambassador to Israel, mm -hmm. Tom Nides, said it's absurd. He, he basically dismissed mm -hmm. the use of the word, mm -hmm. said it's absurd. Even more chilling, Israel's Foreign mm -hmm. Minister, Yair Lapid, immediately said that amnesty quoted lies spread by terrorist organizations. Mm -hmm. um, the Israeli government accused amnesty of anti-Semitism. Let's set the mm -hmm. last one aside because that's too big a discussion. Let's go directly to Foreign Minister Lapid's claim, because I'd like you to answer that. He has accused Amnesty of quoting lies spread by terrorist organizations. What would you say to the Foreign mm -hmm. Minister? Well, we'd say that actually his reference, I mean, we know, we know exactly what he means when he refers to terrorist organizations. He's actually referring, in this case, to Palestinian human rights organizations. And, 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 and this is... This is the smokescreen that the Israeli authorities, and in fact, this is actually a part of the system of apartheid because part of the system of apartheid is muzzling voices that are critical of that system because it is acts that muzzle the criticism that, that are intended to maintain that system. And, th and that is what we would say, actually what you're, you're alluding to there, and some people may not pick it up, you're alluding to the fact that you as a government labeled, designated six well-respected, I mean, these are organizations that have been going for years. They've been, they've received over decades funding from, uh, you know, from, from the most respected foundations and UN sources and, 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 and EU funds in some cases. I mean, these people don't give out their funds lightly. Um, and the, their track record, not only, let's be clear, not only of criticizing the Israeli authorities, but they spend their time as well criticizing their own authorities. So the idea that, I mean, it's just, it's so ludicrous, but it's so sinister at the same time, because these labels, they have the danger to, to, to stick. I mean, we were actually meeting um, and, 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 and expressing our solidarity and how we were going to work with them to fight this label today is the, the, some of those very organizations. And yes, uh, we stand very, very firm and proud to work with them. And it's not only us, it's Israeli human rights organizations, it's other international human rights organizations. So yes, we do work with them to uh, obtain evidence of human rights violations by the Israeli state, by the Palestinian authorities. So that's just what he's referring to, but actually what he's revealing by making that comment actually is re reveals something of the nature of, of, uh, of an estate that practices apartheid. It cannot, deal with, uh, it cannot deal with critical voices and it has such power to oppress and dominate Palestinian voices that it can use 
willy-nilly a label of terrorism to uh with and let's be clear without a shred of evidence without a shred of evidence that has been put in the in in, in the public domain uh, uh so it's 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 pitiful really and, and disappointing because actually at a repeat we wrote to him in october last year asked and uh, we, we asked our secretary general wrote to him last october said can we can we talk about some of our findings um and have a dialogue about this but, as normal, we had a lack, complete lack of response. And I mean, the response back is an ideological one. It's not a serious one. I mean, this is this is a response that shows zero engagement with the facts. There's no disputing the home demolitions. There's no disputing the unlawful killings. We don't hear that. There's no disputing the laws that have been put in place. It's an ideological response. Well, uh, Philip, we'll be sure to take this clip of your last answer and send it to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs <laughs> in Tel Aviv Indeed. and ask them what they feel now. Uh, that's why I mentioned that it's a 280 page report, detailed forensic report. We've been talking to Philip Luther, who's, you know, uh, been there at Amnesty for over 20 years, <laughs> speaks uh, forensically, almost legally, but underneath that, there's a lot of emotion when you talk about home demolitions, about Bedouins being pushed off their land, and so on. Thanks a lot for joining us at People's Dispatch and Globetrotter. Thanks so much for having me, Vijay. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks. Thank you.